So it's so important that we're arming our team members and arming our staff with these type of techniques that allow them to avoid the physical confrontation. That's never going to look good. No matter how you try to spin it, it's never going to look good. So it's always the uh, best opportunity to try to avoid it using that verbal de-escalation. I'm going to be like the color commentary. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so our here. approach is based on some industry best practices. Um, there's a lot of information out there. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security puts out information on de-escalation. You know that it, it's important in a number of different sectors. And so there's, there's programs out there uh, through CESA and, and other programs. Uh, and we've taken sort of the, the best practices from all of them, from the GBI, from the Judo. But really what brings us here today is sort of the uh, collective extensive law enforcement and private sector uh, experience that, that we bring. And so you know, de-escalation is de-escalation, but it's really about educating the folks and, and, and all of us being able to recognize and address uh, these situations. And so I like to look at things from a proactive and reactive standpoint. I don't know if, if anybody here is familiar with Left the Bank, the concept Left the Bank. Two, two hands went up. So I'm not here to interject or to talk about left of bank, other than to say that you can apply this concept in a number of different, you know, from planning to operations, emergency response, and I'm going to apply it to de escalation today. And that is there's a proactive side and a reactive side. So if the event, whatever the event is, you know, there's something that happens before it and you can prepare for it, and then there's the aftermath and, and the response. And so if you look at De-escalation, there's a lot of focus on de-escalation. What I want to introduce and, and have us think a little bit more about is non-escalation. Now I've always said that, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it's just about not making it worse. Not making a situation worse, because we often, we can't really control what the other person is doing, but we can control what we do and we can intercede early. So there's often opportunity Early on, during that, you know, that that stage of acceleration, where if we recognize it, maybe we can cut it off in the past, and we never have to get to the de-escalation part of it because we've avoided that problem from the beginning. And so, if you look at de-escalation. I would say that's that's right of bang. That something is already happening, and now you're addressing it. Where non-escalation is left of bang. It's a much more proactive approach. You need both of them. But we want to look at non-escalation as well. And so, you know, Chuck and I are backgrounds in law enforcement. And I, and I said this all along, that just because you were the police doesn't mean that security is the right fit for you. Because law enforcement is typically what? Reactive or proactive? It's very reactive. You're answering calls and responding to things afterwards, right? When I move to the private sector side, I can't wait for something to happen. We have to eliminate it before it starts, right? Yeah, the one thing about law enforcement, you know, excuse my friend, but by the time we get on the scene, shit already happened. You know, it's, it's a little too late for us to try to uh, de-escalate the situations. We're trying to mitigate a lot of the things that are going on from a 911 perspective. But when I switched over to the private sector and working in the entertainment industry, and I'm going to always talk about casinos because I, I really equate casinos to the adult entertainment We have liquor, we have some people that are upset that they lost money by the way that they lost their money. Uh, but understanding from a security perspective uh, what these men and women deal with because they don't have the luxury of law enforcement having to fit the stick of the We don't have that. So again, from a private security standpoint, the ability to really understand uh, talking down the situation and having that situational awareness before you get to that is so critically important. Yeah. You know, in a crisis, you know, seconds count and the police are minutes away out there, right? And so we have to deal with, we are the first responders, just the other day I learned very quickly, is that I spent a lot of years, you know, classifying law enforcement as first responders, but then when we started doing private sector training, it became very obvious very quickly that you all are the first responders in all of these situations. And so, if you want to look at the stages of, of escalation, you know, you have the, the initial incident, the agitation, and then you have the acceleration phase. 
And so if we get to de-escalation, where we have to utilize tactics and, and you know, um, approaches, that's important because we might not get to that situation until that point, so we have to have those skills. But if it's developing in front of us, and we can sort of stop it along the way during that acceleration phase, there's opportunity there to maybe address these issues beforehand. But you have to be able to recognize it and, and be able to address it. All right. So de-escalation, you know, Homeland Security uh, defines it, and we're talking about um, diffusing aggression. This is not crisis intervention. So there's a big difference between that. Uh, but as we look at the benefits, and obviously for all of your customer-facing staff, it's really important. Um, you know, we, we heard it yesterday, we had some legal updates, and um, you know, minimizes conflict, which then minimizes incidents, which reduces and avoids losses, right? And so we, uh, it also helps the club, and it sort of arms your attorneys and the insurance companies, it arms them with some due diligence, something that you're doing that shows that you're taking it seriously and that you're addressing those issues. So that if something goes bad, and you can at least you try and you have a system in place. Uh, so it includes teamwork, because we're not always talking about conflicts between um, guests and staff. Sometimes those conflicts are between who? Staff, right? So sometimes that's when you create, but we learned yesterday, we kind of snippet up, you know, turning the decibels down slightly in the cloud makes for a, a more enjoyable work atmosphere. Well, if there's less conflict in that atmosphere, that's a much more enjoyable place to work, you know, whether it's between staff, between staff and customers, and so it just makes for a nicer environment. And it increases your return on investment and bottom line. And so, you know, situations that might, you know, obviously these are all pretty obvious. You know, when you check that B at the door, and it's really about establishing those relationships early. This, you know, de-escalation, non-escalation, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and so it's a situation where you want to establish that rapport so that if something does happen, you're not, you're not starting from scratch. You have a relationship um, that you've been procuring and building all the way along. And so all of these are pretty situations where obviously it's probably gotten you know, to that point already. You look at it. Thank you. 
your, your day-to-day practices. Now, how do you recruit your team and retain your team? This has to be something that is done in good faith. And then try to talk a little bit about, you know, even though somebody's been there for a long time, we can't make some assumptions. Okay, we have to start now. And not a lot of times. Because also, like, it's a bit of a bad habit. A lot of times you think of someone who's been in this uh, industry for 10, 20 years, they should know better. Again, if they weren't trained to know better, they can't do better. So it's very important to always reevaluate your staff, reevaluate your policies and procedures, and ensure that the escalation is one of those components. So, yeah, we talk about arming you know, our staff with that knowledge, arming the insurance carriers, arming the legal. Um, you know, with some substance, something to hang your hat on, that if there is an incident, at least we have some recourse and, and response. So right now, you know, I want to uh, talk about a little bit of a practical exercise. And for any of you that want to participate, you can do it from right where you're at, all right? And what I'd like you guys to do, if you want to participate, stand up. So stand up and find a partner, all right? So I can get folks to do that. This is, this is not a gallery but this is an easy one, all right? Uh -oh. And so, like I said, with that said, 
often we're just the ones that, that can control ourselves. And so, first, and it's hard when you're in that situation. You know, um, listen, we all have our, our trigger points. I, I'm the, I used to have a, a, a temper when I was younger. <laughs> I've learned to control it. If, if somebody cuts me off, I don't get upset. And if I cut somebody off, I'm like very apologetic. But if you cut me off and then you flip me off, no, it, <laughs> then all of a sudden, man, the heart rate goes up and, I, and I'm caught up in that moment. Because I'm very apologetic until you've done something wrong and then you, you're mad at me. And so it's, it's hard sometimes not to get upset. So we want to not take it personal. We want to calm down. We'll talk some other tips here, some dudes. You know, low, low tone of voice, don't get defensive, even if the uh, insults are directed at you. Um, if your heart rate goes up, we're going to talk about autogenic breathing. I'll do that in just a second. But I think, you know, this is sort of anecdotal, but I think it's very true that, you know, 10% of conflicts are due to the difference of opinion, 90% are due to tone of voice. Right? And so, that's something for us to keep in mind as we're trying to deal with them. And so, autogenic breathing is done across the board with high military units, school teachers, because once that heart rate goes up, you lose some cognitive skills, you lose some reasoning, and it's very tough to function. You need a certain, there's a, it's a bell curve, uh, inverted U hypothesis. We need a certain amount of stimulus to react, but once we get up to that 140, 160 beats per minute, 180 beats per minute, we're not operating very well. And so, um, there's a hyper, state of like hypervigilant. And so, I just want you to just think about this for a second. Once you start getting into those tense situations, we were like at the airport yesterday, right? We missed it, we got in late. But you're in that tense environment, things are starting to heat up or you anticipate it happening, all you need is like two to three cycles of this. So just do this along with me. So if you inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale. It brings that heart rate down to a manageable level. I've had a number of surgeries recently and I'm, I'm there pre-op, I mean, my heart rate's up, blood pressure's up. I do this, it comes out to a manageable level. So I've seen it work. Now, if you're, if you're getting on your, your Fitbit and you're at 80 beats per minute, it's not going to take you down to 60. But if you're at 160, it's going to get you down to 120. All right? And so the goal, again, isn't really to control somebody else. It's going to be very tough to do that. But we want to control ourselves so that we can help influence that situation. And like I said, our, our response, and it's like Chuck said, everybody's business, you know, not just from security or doormen or door women, but staff, everybody across the board. And so, some of the things that we want to leave you with are some of the basics you might have heard these before. Um, so, <coughs> and I will say that as you're doing that, the more important thing when you talk about some of the uh, common yourself now, it's also for your team member to also be able to. I do, but when you are too hot, I've had times where folks have pulled me out of the situation because they could see that I was getting upset. They knew that okay, this is kind of singular. <laughs> so we need to frame them for the situation and again for the team members to start understanding when like, okay, I see someone being a little upset. I'm gonna pull them out of the situation now. I'm gonna take my turn. So that's another way of de escalating and having all those indicators in the situation of where it's gonna so if this first thing worked, we could end the seminar right now, <laughs> right? <laughs> just if somebody starts to get upset, just tell them to calm down. Simple as that. Does that ever work? No. Nope. Well, that's the other trigger for me, right? <laughs> to tell me to calm down. Um, so again, telling somebody to calm down just doesn't work. Um, don't challenge a point. Again, we want to be aware of our body language and, and, the, and the, you know, sort of what we bring to the table. Uh, don't insult the person. Don't take behaviors, you know, personally. Uh, don't deny the problem or issue. I mean, these are both you know, pretty common. You may want to tell them, hey, your behavior is starting to uh, concern other people. Uh, there's some boundaries here that we have to follow. And so these are just some very basic uh, responses. And so one of the things that we can do, 
So we know what not to do, but what can you do? And again, we're scratching the surface. We have you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. But maintain situational awareness. Be aware of those things around you. Um, lower your voice. I tend to get excited and loud when I talk. I had a, 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 a partner of mine that was very, very good at a business partner at just lowering his voice and slowing his, his brain speed, becoming that wet curtain, if you will, right? And takes that energy out of it. So that really helps lower your voice, slow your brain speed. Watch body positioning, watch your hands, watch their hands, uh, watch how you're presenting yourself. We're going to do another drill here in just a second. Um, we did, we'll, we'll demonstrate it. Be aware of your body language. A lot of person in the back, I've not heard of anything in the back. Remain calm, right? Breathe. And then physical intervention as a last resort. So we're going to talk about maintaining that reaction. We've got personal safety is important. We not only do we want you know, non escalation, but we want uh, verbal, but we want non escalation from a physical standpoint too. And so, um, we're going to do a drill here in just one second. But so instead of calm, so here's some other things to say, you know, specifically in these situations. And some of this information comes from the CISA website, which is a government website. Uh, you know, come back, I can see that you're upset. I want to help. I understand. So those are the kinds of things that maybe encourage some collaboration. Uh, watch your body language. Watch your proximity. Um, and so three attacks, cues. And so I'm going to pause it there for one second. Having a three class night volunteers, so I don't know if I get to do it with the silver. Alright, so what we're going to talk about is the five class Alright, so uh, I just want to introduce this right now before we get into the three attack cues, you know, clues and cues, uh, and just talk about action versus reaction. So we're going to demonstrate this at three different um, stages. The personal space, uh, <coughs> social distancing, and then sort of a, a safety margin, a reactionary gap. So I'm going to, I'm going to put the mic down. Uh, I'll, I'll protect you a lot. And so the first stage, we're going to stand and we're going to be in intimate, intimate distance. Right? I'm going to be action. I'm here is going to be reaction. So my goal is just from here, to reach out to the other side of the face. Your goal is to block.
not going to help you if you're unconscious, you know, or you've got a fist in your face you know, two seconds into the encounter. So again, so now we're at a position where, okay, practicing situational awareness, we're looking for some subtle clues. Sometimes it's just that inappropriate smile, scuffling in the shoes. Um, these are things that sometimes we, we recognize and we don't know why. So it's just important sometimes to quantify them or identify them. Are both hands visible? If somebody drops a hand, hands underneath, hands you know, hidden, um, something could be in that. You know, law enforcement, it's always about watch the hands. Balance or weight shift. So I'm talking to you, and then I do this. What's coming up? And so watch the feet, watch that balance shift, watch that weight shift. Or if this flange, like Chuck just said. You gotta be, you know, and, and sometimes people are just upset. There's a difference between, you know, like frustration and another aggression. What are we saying? Sometimes we just, we don't, we're too worried about what we're gonna say next to not even listen to what they're saying, and they might be telling you exactly what they're going to do, and you should take note of it. Uh, what, are, what are they wearing? Is it appropriate for the season? Are they alone? And of course, there's 25 goodies, you know, JC's list of 58 goodies and be applied to this as well. All right, so we did the, the demonstration, maintain the reaction here gap, talking about the different lines of demarcation uh, and how important that is. And so this gets into now sort of some other, I guess, strategies, if you will, from the standpoint that um, we want to be on the same team. And so when we look at this, we want to establish that rapport that, that Chuck talked about earlier, uh, and so that way we have it when we need it. And it's not about being right or winning that encounter, it's about solving whatever issue you know, that is. And so, as we look at this, to just dissect conflict for just a second, it's human nature that if we're in a conflict together, that my thinking is that whatever you suggest is going to be good for you and bad for me. And whatever I suggest is going to be good for me and bad for you. It's human nature. And so, what we want to do is realize from this standpoint that, I don't know, our, our point of views really aren't that much different than that person we're having a conflict with, especially at a club, from the standpoint that we both want to have, we want that person to have a, a good night, we want them to have a fun time, we don't want to disrupt others, we want to do it safely. So really, our point of view is coming from the same place, and it's really not that far apart. And so, Again, this is taken from a, a lot of different training sessions over the years, but uh, this really stuck out for me uh, in some training that I went through quite some time ago. And it was talking about some responses, verbal responses, to disarm a verbal aggressor. And that is to tell the person, listen, how are you? I feel exactly the same way. That's not catering to somebody, that's inherently true. If I were you, I'd be feeling the same way. So it's a way to sort of disarm them. Um, you don't have to even agree to disagree. It doesn't mean that you're taking on you know, their position, but it's an acknowledgement, right? It's an acknowledgement that you're hearing them. You, know, you may be right, but you just have to be careful when you say, you may be right, but, because now comes a counterpunch, right? So it's more like, you may be right, you might be right. And, not but, and we have to agree to disagree. All right. And then, you know, that's fair. That's a fair statement. That's a fair position. Uh, and then the last one, I didn't really like it at first. Uh, and it was, of course I am. And you're just, you're an asshole. Yeah, of course I am. It comes with the job, right? It's, a, it's a, you know, yeah, that's, I, I have to be sometimes, or at least perceived that way. And so what it does, though, if you understand that Google loop, observe, orient, decide, and act, it's a process that everybody goes through. And what it does is, is anybody expecting any of these responses? <coughs> Probably not. They're looking for that. They're, they're pushing, and what are they expecting back? 
who you got. All of these are this, the flat rate. Right? I remember the first time I did that pushing drill. Instead of having everybody do it, I put one person up, and when I push their hands, it was like a wet dish rag. They just got, they melted. And I went, well, this is not working out very well. But then I thought, well, actually, it's a very good. Because that is really what we should be doing instead of pushing down. So again, ways to just have a verbal aggressor. And then it's hard to see these all read these. So I found a study that talked about like customer satisfaction. Right? So customer satisfaction. And listen to what they said. This is what worked. Think of a time when you were upset at a company and customer service helped you to have a positive outcome. What did they do that made the experience positive in the end? Number one, 46% of the time, or 46% of respondents, they listened carefully, understood the problem, and demonstrated empathy. Active listening. Next, at 33%, they offered a refund, upgrade, or a promo code. They, try, they tried to make it right, right? And then 28%, uh, they didn't say no. But they explained, or they had to explain what they would do to work to resolve the problem. So they didn't say no, they said, here's what we can do, right? And then 21%, um, honest, they didn't make promises they couldn't keep, they were upfront about it. 19%, uh, they were calm, even though I was upset. That it may not resonate at the time, but that resonates afterwards. That's huge, right? They were calm while I was being an idiot. I took that kind of nap, and I, I was an idiot, but they stayed calm. And then last, 16%, they, they expressed, either through words or actions, that they valued me as a customer. All right? So, so that's the end result of doing many times the right things early on, and then if it gets to the de-escalation phase, again, now you're in the reactive mode, but there's still things that you can do to sort of take that energy out of that. And then, not only take the energy out of that situation, but create a positive process, or a positive uh, environment for the future, especially with that, with that individual, all right? So, you know, we talked about verbal de-escalation or non-escalation. There's a physical side to that as well. Um, you know, we talked about 100% hands off, but there are times that that you have to maybe put hands on somebody. And there's ways to do that as well that you don't escalate the situation either, but you can do it safely for yourself and someone else. So, um, for that, we have time for a few questions here. Yeah, we do. Um, have time for a couple questions uh, from 